Now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Mark Nash. Um, Dr. Nash is a tenured professor of neurological surgery and rehab medicine at the Miller School of Medicine um, at the University of Miami. He is also the founding principal investigator and director of applied physiology research for the Miami Project to Cure Paralysis and the director of research for the Department of Rehab Medicine. Dr. Nash is a fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine and has expertise in application of exercise interventions for, per, per, excuse me, for persons with SCI. He has also studied causes of and treatments for their cardiovascular dysregulation and lipid-related disease risks. He has published over 90 manuscripts, scholarly monographs, and book chapters on these and related topics and has served as a consultant and grant reviewer on disability topics for the U.S. National Institutes of Health. Please welcome Mark, Dr. Mark Nash. Thank you. Good morning. Let me add my thanks to Dr. Williams uh, and his colleagues, especially Claudine, for all of the assistance we received in inviting us back. I was here about three years ago and spent a wonderful time uh, on a webcast with his patients and people who were in other locales, and it was a pleasure to do that, so it's good to be back here. Uh, if you're not familiar with law in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, it is required that every, con that every conference like this invite at least one goody two-shoes speaker who is going to address what you're supposed to eat, drink, and how you're supposed to exercise. I am that speaker. And if Dr. Williams was sworn to truth, he would tell you that one of the reasons I am was when I did this three years ago, nobody threw anything at me after the talk, which is what qualifies me to come back and do it again. That's a, a positive outcome. The only way to keep your health is to eat what you don't want, drink what you don't like, and do what you'd rather not. And that's oftentimes the concept, both of people with and without spinal cord injury, uh, Earlier in my career, I used to talk with our patients and our research subjects about their lipid profiles, and I found out quickly that they were about as interested in their HDL as people without disability were interested in their HDL, which was, frankly, not very interested in their HDL. I doubt most of you know what yours is, even though it plays an important part in your health and well-being going forward. That said, the good news is we stopped talking about health and started talking about activity and function because they are very integrated, very interrelated, and especially important as the trajectory of your health and function changes as you age with disability. And so somewhere in the middle of this ICD diagram okay, is activity, okay, which is integrated with your health Okay, and something that is of greater interest for you, especially your activity, your satisfaction, your productivity, uh, and your independence uh, as you live with a physical disability. And that makes this information much more palatable. Now, the talk today is about uh, a medical condition called cardiometabolic syndrome. It used to be called Syndrome X, which explains the X in the middle of the diagram. It is a problem that we have noted for uh, almost two decades in spinal cord injury, but continues to increase in severity uh, and in medical complications, and thus we bring it forward for discussion today. Uh, metabolic X or cardiometabolic is a, is a clustering of health risks that includes elevated blood glucose, impaired glucose tolerance, that's essentially prediabetes, okay, some gain in body weight, uh, lipid disorders, both fasting and after consuming food, Okay, and a disposition toward the development of diabetes through hyperinsulinemia. Okay. From this, we ultimately get frank diabetes, type 2 diabetes, okay, and uh, obesity or overweight conditions, both of which have profound influence, not just on your health, but on your ability to function, to remain independent, and to remain active. Now, the epidemiology of this, and I'm not an epidemiologist, but basically uh, up until the mid-1980s, the major problem involved with spinal cord injury was genital urinary, okay, urinary tract infections that ascended the ureters into the kidneys and then destroyed the kidneys, and renal failure was the common cause of death. 
with improved methods of urological management, we have that problem under much better control. But now the population is aging, and the better control of urinary problems has allowed the emergence of these cardiometabolic syndromes, especially as people age beyond the age of 60 and into roughly 25 or 30 years post-injury. And that encompasses a lot of people in this room that I can see. So our key issues are there are risks and risk factor clustering. We see abnormal lipid profiles both at rest, and we'll show you some data uh, on the postprandial or the after eating consequences, especially with high fat meals. Okay, we're all concerned about overweight and obesity for health, for transfers, for pressure sores, for wheelchair propulsion, for preservation of shoulder function. Uh, and the, I guess, transference of these conditions into frank diabetes uh, and with other medical complications such as hypertension, which are common in people with paraplegia who are aging. We'll also talk a little bit ab about the new areas of inflammatory risks, which have now been documented by six of our laboratories as a special problem in spinal cord injury. The risks that we're talking about are highly associated with physical deconditioning, and with ill-chosen diet, and uh, the poor fitness is documented in a high percentage of people with spinal cord injury. Nearly one quarter of people with an SCI have a physical capacity that borders on or is slightly below the need for capacity to remain independent for the rest of their lives. The population is aging. That doesn't make our prognosis, I guess, happier. Uh, and if you read the newspaper yesterday, both type 2 diabetes and cardiometabolic syndrome are expected to triple within the next 25 years as a medical problem within the United States. This is already a pandemic, okay, already a medical and a financial consequence that, that our health system can ill afford, especially at this time, and therefore must be dealt with very carefully. Now, when I came into this field in 1984, the typical lipid profile of a person with spinal cord injury had simply a low level of the good cholesterol, which is the HDL, and that's what we call cardioprotective. That protects you against heart disease, and that's bullet item down number four. So we see a consistently low level of high-density lipoprotein cholesterol, but as the population ages, I had to change this slide and add the word evolving because it is an evolution, and the evolution is toward the lipid profile of the rest of the population, which is a higher total cholesterol, higher levels of the bad cholesterol, which are the LDL, and elevated plasma triglycerides. If we do some physiology algebra and compute out your future risk, on the second last bullet item where it talks about the ratio of the total cholesterol to the HDL. This is an excellent predictor of your future risk for what we call hard cardiac events. And by hard cardiac events, we mean myocardial infarction, a heart attack, or sudden death. Okay, and any number over 4.5 tells us that with pretty good reliability that your risk for this in the future is significantly elevated and worthy of intervention okay, through various means that we'll talk about a little bit later here. Uh, we'll also show you some data what happens after you eat. We're one of the few labs in the country, if not the world, that looks a lot at what we call postprandial studies. Fasting lipids are interesting, they're nice, but the fact is we don't live in the fasted state. We live in the fed state. Okay? And the good news is I saw all of you eating breakfast this morning. It looked heart healthy to me. And this is not shame-based because right after my talk you go to lunch. Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. This is, these are data from an article I published with, with a colleague, Armando Mendez, in early 2008 which looked at what we thought was an ideal population of young, healthy people with paraplegia. They were roughly 35 years old. They had been injured less than 10 years. They were predominantly non-smokers. And we thought, because of their levels of injury, that this would give us a good benchmark of what the population could be in best case scenario. We were surprised. If you look on the upper right, what you find is that 76% of this population of young, healthy, ideal patients had an HDL or a good cholesterol that was below the warning signals for future heart disease. 
When we look on the lower left, we find that the triglycerides, or fats in blood, was out of reference range for 68% of this ideal population. And when we look at their risk of future heart attack or sudden death, that number came up at 58%. We also found that about a third of the individuals had hypertension, elevated blood pressure, that about, excuse me, slightly more than a third actually had a diagnosis of metabolic X or cardiometabolic syndrome. Okay, even though, again, this was an ideal population, we don't expect it to get better. There is little that we can think of in the aging process or the prolongation of paralysis that will make this scenario look better unless we have dedicated intervention. Now, the other thing, the other reason we did this study was to look at what percentage of patients should be referred to physicians for intervention on these medical disorders. And again, this is the same young, healthy population. 63.4% okay? of this population, nearly two out of three of these individuals, if they presented at the physician's office, and if the physician followed their guidelines, nearly two out of three would immediately have been placed on either therapeutic lifestyle changes to improve their lipid profiles or placed on medicine to, place the, to make these move within reference ranges. Again, an ideal population, two out of three qualified for intervention. And in fact, the number who had been intervened upon was zero. This would be unacceptable in the medical circumstance for people without disability, and we have taken affirmative steps, both in education and additional research, to correct this for the populations of people with disability. Now, I said before, we don't live in the fasted state, even though we commonly do fasting lipids. This was a study we published in 2005, where we looked at, at for the first time, what happens to the lipid profile, especially blood fats, in people with spinal cord injury when they consume a high-fat meal. The meal for this test was haagen ice cream with heavy whipping cream. And I had a whole lot of volunteers for this study. I think even I volunteered. <laughs> so we compared on the line above with a matched population below it without disability, uh, and we found that there was what we call an exaggerated postprandial lipemia, an exaggerated persistence of blood fats okay, after consumption of food, in large part because there's not enough muscle left and the muscle is not metabolically active enough. And the interesting things, there were a couple of interesting things about the data, and this, by the way, has been replicated in another lab and published using the same test meal. The interesting thing is the, the baseline triglycerides in these patients were about 100, which is actually pretty good. So this isn't something that would have been, I guess, cautioned by a standard blood lipid test. And the other thing to consider is this is one feeding with blood sampling over six hours. Under normal circumstance, we would expect people to refeed at four hours. If you eat breakfast at 8 o'clock, you eat lunch at noon, that's four hours later. So in fact, we would expect the line reflecting triglycerides to go up even higher, especially in the disability group, because at four hours, it hasn't even started to come down yet. Those triglycerides or fats hang around in the bloodstream. They are taken up by the cells that line your blood vessels. They are transformed into something called triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, which is the beginning of atherosclerosis and clogging of your arteries. It's not surprising, especially based upon these data, that we see what we do clinically. But in some respects, I see some blocking out there. The, the situation is actually even more compelling than that. We've learned over the years that atherosclerosis or coronary disease isn't simply a bland storage disease for lipids. It is, in fact, in fact an inflammatory condition. Okay? It involves inflammatory cells. It involves inflammatory processes. Okay? In people with spinal cord injury, we find significantly elevated inflammation. That inflammation doesn't always come from the circulatory system. It can come from injury to a shoulder, it can come from a urinary tract infection, it can come from a pressure sore. But the products that are produced by that inflammation 
all contribute to the development of vascular disease. Okay, the products such as the C-reactive protein don't know where they came from. They only know that they are instigators of future disease. They can also come from stored body fat. So the more body fat you have, the more of these inflammatory products you have. The more triglycerides or fat you consume in your meal, the more of these inflammatory products that we see. As yet, as date, six investigative laboratories, including our collaborative work with Dr. Groh, who will be speaking here later on this afternoon, have documented serious elevation of these products in people of spinal cord injury, Okay, and at least two of those studies have observed significant relationships between those inflammation-causing chemicals and other cardiovascular or cardiometabolic disease risks. So what do we do about this? Now that we've discussed some of the causes and the consequences, how do we treat this? And to our benefit, there are existing clinical pathways which have de been developed over decades for people without spinal cord injury that could be very easily applied for those with. Okay, these are the data from the National Cholesterol Education Project, what we call the Adult Treatment Panel, which comes out every seven or eight years. And this is a systematic way of dealing with the problem that we've talked about this morning. And this is the four-step management system. The first thing you do is eliminate drugs and biologicals that worsen the lipid profile, the major one being the use of tobacco. Okay. Other than that, there are actually very few medicines that people with spinal cord injury take that would be causing this problem. The second thing one does is to undertake dietary modification and to incorporate exercise within the lifestyle. And if those are not successful in resolving the problem, one goes to pharmacotherapy the use of medicines. Now, lifestyle changes last about two weeks and are soluble in alcohol. Okay. It is difficult to change lifestyle. We know that. But this is still the first step we take, and we've taken it in a way that we can attempt to make it as palatable as, process, as possible, as, as less an intrusion on your lifestyle as we can possibly make it, and if at all possible, to make it fun. Okay. Some information we've learned along the way is that if you are going to undergo these changes, that you should plan on combining both diet and exercise because each of them independently would only border on resolving the problem. You need to use them together. And I won't be talking about diet this, this morning. Uh, we're leaving that for Dr. Grow this afternoon. Uh, we're emphasizing the intensity of work that's done rather than the time that's committed on the task. It's not how long you exercise, it's how many calories you consume. And the more intensely you exercise, the better it is. Okay. If we're going to resolve inflammation as opposed to lipid problems, which are normally resolved within several weeks on an exercise protocol, we need a longer period of time, or we need to go to a medicine, and we'll talk about one of those options later in the talk. And the last thing we'll talk about is which exercise because there are a lot of options for you. Should you be doing endurance or aerobic exercise, or should you be incorporating some weightlifting or resistance activity in the program, okay, which we find to be more effective in achieving a lot of the goals that are focused on for people with disability. Now, the fitness deficits have been widely documented in this population, and the term that's commonly used is people with spinal cord injury really exist at the lowest end of the human fitness continuum. Okay. That is, after injury, there is no other disability or no other condition that renders somebody so physically deconditioned as is an individual with spinal cord injury. This is recoverable, okay, but it takes some intervention and some work on your part. Okay. Lots of people never recover to their pre-injury levels of fitness. The population, again, is aging, which worsens the prognosis. And this has implications beyond your health. It has implications for your finances, for your caregivers, for your spouses, and for society, okay, all of which can suffer as a consequence of these conditions. You're in partnership with all of these entities, and it's important that we resolve them in focused ways in order to achieve our global mandates. Now, what is the best exercise prescription? Now, it's the one that this research subject tells you. 
Okay? She was a Brazilian model who was in a car that drove over a Brazilian cliff, fell a long distance, broke her neck, and became tetraplegic. She swears in Portuguese. That's so the other people around her don't hear. The best exercise prescription is the one that should improve all attributes of fitness. Strength, anaerobic power, which is a very important and probably underestimated component of your need for daily activities, to push up wheelchair ramps, to push up ramps in parking garages, to generate quick bursts of energy. You need to be endurant to sustain these energies for long periods of time, and you need to be flexible enough to avoid problems in your joints and the pain that's associated with them. We need to achieve musculoskeletal balance, especially with respect to the shoulder. The front of the shoulder and the chest tend to become tight from wheelchair propulsion. The rotator cuff and back of the shoulder tend to become weakened and stretched, and that's part of the contribution we have to rotator cuff tears and long-term pain. Shoulder pain estimated as, as with a prevalence as high as 100% in some articles. We need to improve function. The activity should enhance your ability to perform your daily activities. It should transfer to allow you to pull yourself more easily in your car, to transfer more effectively and efficiently, or if you wish, to pull yourself out of a swimming pool without needing assistance. It should address the, the, the health risks that we've talked about, the cardiometabolic health risk, and it should be fun. Because if it's not fun, you're not going to do it and then none of the other benefits are going to be achieved. So here are some of the options that we have for common endurance exercise. On the left upper, we have a VitaGlide, which we use a lot at the Miami Project and is used a lot in our, in our grant studies. Uh, one can use a wheelchair, although unless it's specially built for that purpose, we don't recommend them for exercise programs. An arm crank ergometer are you, is, is available. It's relatively inexpensive. Uh, it's not always the best thing for the shoulder, and it's got awful boring. Okay. To arm crank for 45 minutes three or four times a week will put you to sleep, and you'll be doing this in your sleep. And there are other recreational sorts of things. On the right, we have something called a Burkle bike. Okay, which links the wheelchair to a hand cycle. They're used more in Europe here in the States. Obviously, they take some terrain, and you know it depends on the geography, it depends on the weather, but we encourage a lot of our patients to go out okay, and use these recreationally, especially in safe areas. Uh, there are very few of them in Miami, I can tell you, and the weather isn't always what we would like it to be, uh, but there are lots of interesting uses for recreational exercise. If one does this, okay, if one undergoes this type of physical activity, if you look at the fitness gains on the right column, you'll see that individuals with paraplegia who undergo arm crank ergometry or wheelchair ergometry increase their level of fitness by about 15% within six weeks to three months. If you are tetraplegic, undergoing the same activities, you can normally expect an increase in your work capacity or your level of fitness by roughly 10% over the same period of time. Now, the obvious question that follows is, is this enough? And the answer is yes. It actually takes very little increase in fitness and a relatively short period of time to restore insulin sensitivity to a person who has lost it through cardiometabolic syndrome. So the good news is you don't have to do a lot and you don't have to be a wheelchair athlete in order to accomplish these goals. It takes a little bit of work and we know that the people who benefit most from activities, whether they are disabled or not, benefit from low levels of fitness rather than high levels of fitness. And if there's a message that you take home today, you don't have to climb Mount Everest. You just have to get over the hill. Does this affect the lipid profile? The answer is yes. Okay, again, if we go to the right column, any number of studies have shown us that improvements in good cholesterol, okay, a decrease in the risks from the total cholesterol to HDLC ratio are accomplished by these activities by people with spinal cord injury both paraplegic and tetraplegic, 
although they seem to do better at higher intensities of work. The more intensely you work, the more calories you consume, the better the results. Now, we have piloted and pioneered the use of an activity called circuit resistance training. This is an outgrowth of, of some work that was done by one of my doctoral students, Pat Mosier, in type 1 diabetic adolescents, and we basically piggybacked it and developed a circuit for people with spinal cord injury. It involves using weightlifting equipment adapted for people who use it with a wheelchair. We have six resistance maneuvers. They do 10 repetitions of two activities sequentially and then do two minutes of very rapid arm work and then go back and do two more of these resistance activities and then two more and rotate through this process three times. That is the entire cycle, which takes about 43 minutes. There is no rest. This is very aggressive. We start at low levels and then build people through the process of using this and we buddy people up so that two, three, or four people are doing it at the same time. This is not lift a little weights, go get a drink of water, and towel yourself off. This is boot camp. Okay? And the patients really like it because when they're done, they're done. These are the exercises that we use for paraplegics starting from the upper left and going across the top line, military press. We work very hard in the second diagram on shoulder, especially posterior shoulder, and stabilization of the shoulder blades or the scapulas. Okay. We do essentially butterfly, okay, which is a chest press. We do elbow flexion. Now elbow flexion biceps is not a weakness in the population, but it happens that our patients like to look buff. And if the reason the patients show and go through the whole program is they like to look buff, that's okay with us. Okay. After the arm crank, they resume again, do wide grip latissimus pull down, and in the lower right, very functional activity, especially for transfers, is rickshaw or triceps depression. Boy, doesn't he look happy. If we do this in published studies for 12 weeks in individuals with paraplegia, we increase their level of fitness by 30%, not 15. So actually you become more endurant by doing weightlifting than you do by doing endurance activity. The second thing it does is to improve your anaerobic power. Okay, the, the type of fitness that you need for pushing up ramps and pushing up and using ballistic movements at high intensities over very brief periods. We increase that significantly in a way that is not achieved by doing endurance activity. Strength changes, we shifted on the second line, it runs somewhere between 20 and 40% with the exception of elbow flexion, which is a little bit lower. But again, that's not an area of weakness. That's an area where people like to look buff. We have done this study in Older people with spinal cord injury, affectionately we have called them middle-aged. Please don't ask me to define that. My wife is watching the webcast. <laughs> actually, we've gone up to age 58, and in this particular study, we actually enrolled people who had shoulder pain at the start of treatment. Okay? We actually selected people okay, who had existing shoulder pain to see if this would make their shoulder pain go away. So we do see the same strength changes in people up to age 58. And when we do measurement of shoulder pain using a validated instrument in this population, we see significant reductions in shoulder pain and a significant improvement in wheelchair performance. In fact, in this particular study, there were nine subjects. Six of the nine finished treatment without any shoulder pain whatsoever. The lipid profiles, I had to get to lipids because that's what we're talking about today. Significant reductions in total cholesterol, about a 10% improvement in the good cholesterol, HDL, about a 25% reduction in the bad cholesterol, LDL, and the overall risk decreased by about 27%, the risk of future heart attack or sudden death. 
Now, this is a study. We've actually taken some data that just this past week from some ongoing work where we were looking at whether our best reduction of lipids occurs if we exercise three days a week, allowing 48 hours in between these sessions, or should we be doing shorter sessions every single day? And this, the importance of this is to get an exercise prescription that best fits the needs of people with spinal cord injury. Oftentimes, that prescription is meant for healthy, able-bodied people, and that's not particularly a good fit. And what we find is that we actually, when we look at the use of triglycerides, and the AUC means the area under curve, these are feeding studies where we feed a high-fat meal and we have an exercise bout either 24, excuse me, either 48 hours before it or up to about 16 hours before it. On the right-hand side, if you see at five months, we actually do better okay, in reducing overall fats on a daily basis in fed individuals with spinal cord injury by doing shorter bouts of activity and doing them every day. Okay? And our issue in exercise medicine isn't how much exercise you need. The issue is how little you need. And we're trying to define how little you need to do in order to successfully imp improve your resistance to these disorders while allowing time for other activities and the fact that exercise shouldn't be an intrusion on your lifestyle. Some years ago, recognizing that finances are an issue, not everyone has access to the equipment that we use, even though it's commercially available. Not everyone has access to a medical center. So I gave my graduate students $50, and I told them to go design a home program for people with spinal cord injury that would do exactly the same thing that we saw in our laboratory studies. And they were successful in doing that. They used TheraBand. They took T-shirts and wrapped them over wood tied them with duct tape, used hurricane lashings. We have a lot of those in South Florida. Okay. And designed a program that would elicit a response from patients that was the same as the expensive equipment that you just saw in some of the other diagrams. And they were successful in doing it. There was no difference in the heart rate responses. There was no difference in the oxygen consumption. And in fact, the perceived exertion Okay, the perception of the work that was done in this by the research subjects with spinal cord injury was in fact higher than we achieve using Helms equalizers and adapted universal equipment. One of my research subjects is a professional writer. Alan Troop took this information, had some fun with it in writing up his own home program. Using his creativity, he took a pegboard, put some slots in it, hung some weights from it and some TheraBand, developed a program that he uses three days a week, even though he has C6 tetraplegia for more than 30 years, and he's lost about 40 pounds on the program. Okay? So that is his dedication, a little bit of creativity in a home program. I haven't seen him in the gym in years. Okay? He simply does this at home. It's more convenient for him, and he does it with a buddy who lives around the corner with him who is similarly situated. So far, we've talked about paraplegics. We've received grant from the Craig Nielsen Foundation to adapt this for individuals with tetraplegia. And so everyone here, you see, is in a grant program currently where we see similar benefits adapted for people with tetraplegia. Our oldest patient right now is 70 years old. 70 years young, I should say. He shows up three days a week, and the last time he missed an exercise session was on the actual day of Hurricane Wilma five years ago. He was, however, there the next morning. We've reported in scientific meetings that the benefit specifically for individuals with tetraplegia okay, increased the good cholesterol by 17%. They lower the risk of heart attack and future heart disease by 7%. They lower insulin levels and improve insulin sensitivity. They improve the processing of food as it passes through the system, removing fats and glucose more effectively, okay, and overall 
increased strength, endurance, and anaerobic power. So this works for individuals with tetraplegia. We've gone up as high as a C5-6 tetraplegic successfully. You have to have a C5 intact in order to do this, obviously. But we've been successful with okay, a, a good number of individuals with tetraplegia. Now, if these things don't work or for higher levels of injury, we have completed the first randomized multicenter clinical trial looking at lipid lowering with an available drug called niacin. Now, niacin is essentially extended release niacin, the same niacin that you get in your one a day multiple vitamin, although at higher dosages. This was reported at the American Spinal Injury Association. The article reporting it is in press in the Archives of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Niospan is an FDA-approved drug. It's the oldest and best-used drug for raising the good cholesterol, HDL. It raises it by about 26%. It's kind of the Rodney Dangerfield of medicines because it doesn't get enough respect for what it does for other lipids. It lowers total cholesterol, it lowers LDL, and it also lowers triglycerides. Not as good as a statin like Lipitor or Crestor, but still pretty good. And it's one of the few drugs that actually reduces the risk of future heart disease. It reduces your risk of fatal myocardial infarction or heart attack by 11%. Okay. The downside to it is as you increase the dose, there is a flushing effect which has to be managed by taking aspirin at bedtime. So we conducted a randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled, multicenter trial to look at this drug over a 48-week period in individuals with C5 and 6 tetraplegia. The findings were the medicine was safe. We administered more than 10,000 dosages of the drug. There were only four adverse events, two of them having to do with an increase in uh, stool softening for patients who were already on stool softeners, and two of the individuals had flushing that they found un unacceptable and dropped from the trial. That's an event rate that's actually even better than the same drug used in people with heart disease but without disability. The drug was well tolerated. There were minor effects on discomfort that were largely managed by the aspirin, and it was judged to be effective. It significantly improved the good cholesterol, significantly lowered bad cholesterol, fat and total cholesterol, and corrected these global risks that predict future disease. Now, there's one other medicine that we are looking at now Okay, as a possible use for cardiometabolic syndrome, and this is part of a grant also from the Craig Nielsen Foundation, uh, called salsalate. Salsalate is a very old drug, so old that it's generic, so old that it's inexpensive. And in looking at this, salsalate is very much like aspirin. Okay, it isn't what we call an aspirin prodrug. You cannot give aspirin in high dosages because of risks of bleeding and risks of ulcers and gastritis. But salsalate, unlike that as a prodrug, doesn't cause those sorts of changes. And therefore, we can give it in higher dosages. The use of aspirin for treating diabetes and prediabetes dates back almost 100 years. Okay? And there's great interest in this drug in the diabetic population as a possible substitute for a very expensive drug, the blockbuster drug metformin or glucophage, that work being conducted at the Joslin Institute. So we've looked at, these are the data from the first five subjects. I know that it's a little bit light on the right side, but actually you're about the first people to see these data. Uh, the fasting studies are looking at inflammatory risks. That's the IL-6, interleukin-6. Okay. Looks at insulin, blood sugar, and triglycerides, or fats. And in all cases, after as little as one month of treatment, we can lower the risks in the upper left of C-reactive protein, an inflammatory product that, that accelerates or instigates arterial sclerosis. It significantly lowers the triglycerides or fats in blood. Okay. It lowers the interleukin-6. And in the lower left, it really didn't change blood sugar. However, it reduced the amount of insulin that was needed to maintain it. And that's an improvement in insulin sensitivity in the direction that we would like to see for our patients. 
So we, we have this puzzle of cardiometabolic disease. We've needed to establish evidence of the risks, and we've done that, so much so that the paralyzed veterans have seated a clinical practice guideline panel for both cardi for carbohydrate and lipid in metabolism. We are currently writing the new guidelines for management of these conditions in spinal cord injury. We've reported with Dr. Groh and other colleagues okay, the risks of these disorders and their meaning for people and their activity and function with spinal cord injury. We've established in authoritative publications the evidence that supports the use of exercise therapy. The first article on pharmacotherapy is now in press, and we have good data to suggest that there are other medicines that would be equally effective but need still to be tested for their unique application for spinal cord injury. And our final frontier is dietary therapy, which Dr. Groh will talk about this afternoon. We've been awarded a $2 million grant from the Department of Defense to resolve this issue over the next four years with partners at the Shepherd Center in Atlanta to especially design diets that will reverse these medical complications and especially prevent diabetes in people with spinal cord injury. So our last goal is to get that piece to fit right in. And when we do that, we will have a complete story for the population of people with spinal cord injury and as much protection as we can offer okay, and you can offer yourselves. So we summarize cardiometabolic disease, all-cause diseases remain a serious problem for the population. It is made more compelling by aging. Okay. Assessment and therapy is essential if you are to lead an active, satisfied, productive life and a healthy life, okay, all of them being essential to who you are and the people who you live with and love. As a, as a matter of fact, we're less prepared to rehabilitate this problem than we are to prevent it, okay, which means that the prudent thing to do is to design these programs for prevention rather than recovery from illness and from disabling activity. And as a practical matter, we've been talking about clinical trials. These are all relevant to your candidacy for these clinical trials. When we sent men to the moon and women to the moon, they were healthy, they were active, and they were full functional. Okay? When they had medical problems, they were excluded from these. And as a practical point of view, now that we are transplanting stem cells and at our center shortly, Schwann cells to achieve the same goals of functional restoration. It makes sense, it is prudent okay, to manage these problems in order to maximize your candidacy and the benefit of outcomes from the procedures. Keep in mind, this is about activity and function. Okay. We're still learning about what causes these things, but we have a pretty good picture that physical deconditioning is undoubtedly among them. We think that resistance exercise is the ideal approach if it can be utilized. However, dogma has no particular place in this. Fitness and reduced susceptibility can be acquired through other means, and we encourage patients to do things with which they will be compliant in the long term. I'm grateful it takes a village to do this. These are my colleagues, both at our center and the others with whom we collaborate. I'm grateful for our funding support from the National Institute of Disability and Rehabilitation Research in three grants, one with Dr. Groh, the Craig Nielsen Foundation with two grants, the Department of Defense, and the Miami Project. And I appreciate your interest, attention, and I'd be pleased to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Is that on time? Perfect. Wow. And on time. <laughs> so I see we have a question in the back here. Sorry. Hi, my name is Kristen, and I have a C6 spinal cord injury chronic 27 years. And I was wondering, have you looked at FES at all? Because I've heard that it is aerobic, it's not aerobic, it builds muscle, it doesn't build muscle. And I, I just didn't know if you had any thoughts on that or had done any research on that. When I began my career in spinal cord injury in 1984, uh, 
The first studies we did were part of the four center study on FES, and we, we had an outpatient clinic that I directed uh, providing FES cycling until 1989 when I had to go back fully into the research realm. Uh, restoring muscle mass with FES cycling is actually pretty easy. Okay. Whether it's aerobic or not is an interesting question. And the, the, the reason that we don't tend to think of it as being aerobic is the physiological responses to it don't tend to be aerobic. They tend to be higher in intensity. They tend to use carbohydrates or sugars as the fuel in order to drive muscles, which actually makes it look more like resistance exercise than it does aerobic. However, the studies from our center that, we, that we've published and the studies of others that have come behind us clearly benefit cardiovascular function, increase in muscle mass, and improvement of circulation both at rest and should there be an ischemia or an interruption of blood flow. We have a gentleman in the back. Uh, Dr. Nash, I have a, uh, it's, it's a three-part question. Um, I, I was a triathlete before my injury, and um, we used a maximum heart rate, simple formula of 220 minus your age. Um, you can do it the long way out, but um, I, when, when I'm on my hand cycle, I try to wear a heart rate monitor uh, because of my level of injury at, um, C5, the, um, obviously I don't have the, the, the muscle content to get my maximum heart rate up. Number one, is that critical? Um, it's nice that you talked about um, ASA therapy um, and, and CRP, which 20 years ago doctors never knew what it even meant. Um, but you didn't list any contraindications, i.e. Coumadin or Warfarin, um, as far as uh, do those have to, do those, would those have the same uh, benefits? And, and my last part of my question is, and it may be answered later, is um, you know 65% of us on the internet is either inaccurate or false. So it's very hard to find research as a calorie per pound um, for an able-bodied person. It would be between 10 and 15. But there's very little study out there that shows how many calories per pound are we supposed to be taking in to maintain uh, homeostasis or equilibrium. Um, I don't know if you can remember all that. Okay, yeah. I'll give it a shot. The first, the first question had to do with essentially what's called your functional sympathectomy. You have an injury in the cervical spinal cord above the level where the autonomic nervous system releases epinephrine, adrenaline, or norepinephrine, noradrenaline. That's one of the factors that drives heart rate higher in a person without disability. However, as, as a consequence, your maximum heart rate is probably going to be in the 125 range. You won't drive it much higher than that. And if anyone here is on a beta blocker drug, we see exactly the same thing in beta blockers for cardiac patients. Maximum heart rate of about 125. So with respect to computing target heart rates, we have a mechanism to do that. And we've published it. It's called the Carvonin method where we, instead of using 220 minus age, which have application in individuals with paraplegia, especially T6 and lower, but not uh, tetraplegia, what we use is we measure your maximum heart rate and then use something called a percentage of your heart rate reserve, the difference between your resting heart rate and your maximum attainable heart rate. And if you train in that range, you will benefit from those training benefits just as a patient on beta blockers does. That was number one. Number two, contraindications to exercise. Okay. Obviously, ischemic heart disease, and we test for that. So we do arm crank tests to make sure somebody doesn't have an existing rhythm disturbance or restriction of blood flow to the heart that might cause coronary disease, okay, or exacerbate it. Okay, Coumadin is not a contraindication to exercise. Uh, obviously, you know, our, our largest concern that we have difficulty testing for is fracture, because we don't know the fracture thresholds, okay, how much force is needed to break a bone after osteoporosis is set in with spinal cord injury. However, there have been very few reported fractures, long bone fractures, Okay, with FES cycling, and certainly fewer with voluntary exercise of the upper extremity. Okay, in Miami, we worry about the heat. 
in Boston, you worry about the heat. Okay, you have hot, humid summers. You have cold winters. Obviously, temperature regulation okay, is a significant concern. Damage to the musculoskeletal system. If I pull a shoulder muscle, as my 12-year-old son would say, big whoop. If you pull a shoulder muscle, it's something different. So some education. And, and one of the things we're doing as an aside, and my colleague Kim Anderson Arisman, who's a, a card-carrying neuroscientist and our director of education at the Miami Project, happens to be C5 injury also. Uh, one of the things that she's done as part of one of my grants is to examine barriers to exercise. What keeps people, physical barriers, financial barriers, time barriers, interest barriers, motivation barriers, where are those barriers because we can create the best program available, but if people don't use it, it's not. So right now we are working, we expect the article to be out later this year on reasons that people don't. Okay? And if we can address those through some really good education, which is what conferences like this are about after all, thank you Dr. Williams, okay? that's how we get the information out. The third question quickly was uh, uh, calories per pound, calories. Per pound of body weight. Okay, because of the difference in the use of arms rather than legs, because of the difference in individual differences in the available amount of muscle mass, okay, what we need is something called a compendium of energy consumption. That exists for people without spinal cord injury. It's called the Ainsworth Compendium, named after Barbara Ainsworth. The group in Chicago, and I, I know, remember the physiologist's name, it's Ed Langbein, and I think he's retired now, but his colleagues have published in the Jury Journal of the American College of Sports Medicine the first compendium of physical activity for people with spinal cord injuries. And that was done about six months ago and will give you pretty good estimates in the caloric expenditure for lots of different daily activities and recreational uh, activities in which you're engaged. Can you repeat that? Thank you very much. That's medicine and science in sports and exercise, which is the peer review journal of the American College of Sports Medicine. That was the first compendium that, that has simulated what Barbara Ainsworth did in a broader scale. And it's, and it's a first study, and it's some pretty good estimates, we think, that will vary uniquely by level of injury, type of injury, Okay, uh, your level of fitness and other things, but it's it's a really good start and we really needed it. We have a question over here. Yes, sir. Um, I have found the typically recommended uh, low-fat uh, diet seems to be incredibly boring to me. Tastes like trash. Uh, I sound like you have a lot of agreement. Um, <laughs> Have you looked at anything doing with low-carb, Atkins-style diet? I have found it's much easier to give up carbs than it is to give up steak. Uh, and I noticed the one feeding type you mentioned was a very high-carb, high-fat combination. And I'm wondering, have you, is there any research on low-carb, like Atkins-type lifestyle? Because I know I benefited. I'd lost about 40, 50 pounds on it. Uh, pre-injury, and uh, I know there is a lot of anecdotal stuff on the board. I haven't seen any studies saying that they Atkins low-carb people get good cholesterol readings, even though they're eating a high-fat diet, uh, have very good results in terms of diabetes. Some of the people I've seen talk about being off insulin, and so forth. Is there anything related to that for post-injury people as to whether low-carb lifestyle is helpful for maintaining good numbers, as you were mentioning, for your other stuff? Sure. Uh, the first thing is, is a general comment. It's embarrassing what we know about appropriate diet in people with spinal cord injury. Uh, we published one of the first studies in 1992 that warned that the diet was inappropriate. Uh, some work we've done with Dr. Grow. Uh, as part of her Rehabilitation Research Training Center from NIDER has validated it. Our data were very close, okay, even though the studies were published nearly 18 years apart. What I can suggest to you is the best, oh, by the way, the test, those are test meals that we use for testing the responses. So I don't recommend Haagen-Dazs ice cream and heavy whipping cream as, as a, I know, it's a bummer, isn't it? 
Uh, what I can suggest to you is uh, that we are t what we're working on now is very close to Mediterranean, okay? a Mediterranean-type diet, which is lower in saturated fat but allows fat from sources such as olive oil and you know, omega-3-type fatty acids. And that's what we're funded by the DOD to look at, you know, more fruits and vegetables, but still keeps it interesting. And I can tell you from just kind of anecdotal personal experience, this is the only way that my patients lose weight, is when they, they've tried South Beach, uh, but they don't stay on it for extended period of time and they tend to yo-yo. The patients who have been on Mediterranean tend to stay on Mediterranean. Okay, and you can, you can find that easily on the web. If you Google on Mediterranean diet, you'll get a complete description of everything. Or you go to the bookstore and you get the book on Mediterranean diets for dummies, which is what I did. We have a question from somebody watching on the Internet. Thank you very much. Uh, two questions, actually, from the webcast. The first is, why does my blood pressure go up at night when I lay down, and what can be done about it? It has gone up to 260 over 150. I take a brazosin, 2 milligrams, but sometimes it still goes up. Well, I, I am, I'm somewhat distant, and there would be an awful lot more information I need to know. I, would need, you know, I don't know the level of injury of the individual, factors such as renal status. You know, I'm, I'm sure that they've been worked up. I trust that they've been worked up for this. It's difficult to diagnose long distance. And, and the best approach is, is a spinal specialists. Okay, if I don't know where they're calling in from or sending this from, uh, but a local center that, that specializes in spinal cord injury would be their best approach for that type of, of real differential diagnosis that they need. Okay, thank you. We will follow up with them. Uh, the next question comes from another webcast. I cannot use my diaphragm or stomach muscles, so I can't do the sit-ups. What type of exercise can I get the benefits of sit-ups from? Uh, and his cholesterol level, he's not sure which one, is 170, as told by his doctor. Well, 170 could be either total cholesterol or LDL. If his total cholesterol is 170, he gets a big smile. If his LDL cholesterol is 170, we need to look at intervention. So it would depend on which one it is. Okay, that was the first one. With respect to abdominals, okay, we've dealt with this over the years. Okay, there are two issues, is how much fat is over the abdominal muscles and what is the abdominal tone? Uh, with respect to reducing the circumference, waist size, uh, there are two goals. One is to reduce the amount of fat that's, that's surrounding the waist, and that will make it smaller. If they don't have tone, uh, they're, they're probably not going to give, get a six-pack, and that's something they probably have to give up. I've given that up, too, by the way. So we're in the same boat there. Uh, We've, we've looked at electrical stimulation. There are electrical stimulators that can be used for abdominals. Most of them are used for coughing assist. They contract the abdominals forcefully, okay, especially in individuals who have higher injuries and can't cough. Okay, and there are commercial devices that do that. And we have prescribed for some people for cosmetic use, okay, simple two-channel electrical stimulation devices Okay, to increase the tone of those muscles, and that also contributes to a little smaller waist. Do we have any more questions from the audience? I think there's a oh, is there woman a down here. Thanks, Marie. In your speech, I never heard um, anything about quadriplegia in regards to exercising. I don't know if the fall under the category of um, tetraplegia? The, the terms that we use, okay, tetraplegia is the, currently the appropriate term to use for an individual who has what we used to call quadriplegia. They are, they're used synonymously. Okay. Thank you. We, we tend to use the more informal settings like this okay, when we're talking to patients, they're quads and paras in all truth because our patients prefer that. But. Actually, when we submit articles for publication, you know, we actually refer to people first and then disability second. That's standard procedures. Yeah, we have one more question here as well. Mm, there's a woman over there too. Um, I have injury to my lumbar uh, spine. I have uh, three discs there that I've, I've injured. And I use a TENS unit that has the two channels. 
Now, is that what you're talking about in regards to the abdomen? Electrical stimulation can be used for a number of different medical reasons. Okay? TENS, or transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, is usually a very high intensity, very low frequency electrical current, which is dedicated toward reducing pain. The, uh, the so-called FES, or functional electrical stimulation, or neuromuscular electrical stimulation, has much lower frequencies okay, and higher intensities. So it's, it's an, a different waveform that's used to elicit muscle contraction. We have a I question from there Carol. There was a woman here. Um, your research is great, and um, how in line are your research to insurance companies so they will actually um, pay for exercise programs for spinal cord injury? Every, I'm still doing cool therapy, but every year it's more difficult as my injury gets older. That They say it's um, maintenance and not rehab. And I've had to document shoulder and wound and, and pictures of how it's better if I go swimming 40 times a year than if I don't, and how my health goes downhill. So are you working with the insurance companies to promote this exercising with spinal cord injuries as a, a cost saving in the long run as we live longer? We speak at insurance conferences. We meet with insurance colleagues. In, insurance doesn't treat anybody better than anybody else. We're all treated badly. <laughs> Uh, and I don't want to indict, I guess I should say some of my best friends are in, no, that's not true. Uh, and I, I can tell you, however, my wife is a, is a physical therapist who specializes in spinal cord injury, and you know, it's, it's part of, of what we do in trying to translate these things for patient benefit as much as possible. You know, you're, you're asking a really tough question, and you know, Susan got it a little bit earlier about you know, what type of advocacy. We write letters more than you can imagine. I wrote the earliest letters for FES bikes until ultimately I almost had no time to do research. So we do have that advocacy, but that's also one reason that we designed the home programs, okay, which can be done relatively inexpensively without needing some, some of the other sorts of therapy so that there's at least an alternative that you can do to, to take care of yourself and then we prescribe very carefully what your needs are in that exercise program you know, to match pain or limited function or, or other issues that you have medically. But yes, we spend a lot of time with insurance companies. Dr. Lesh, I have a question for you. In your studies, have you seen whether stress, psychosocial issues may have been barriers to the effectiveness of some of your interventions? I'm sorry, could you say again? It's a little hard. Just wondering if you have seen whether psychosocial issues or stress, have you seen in your studies that they have been, they were barriers to the effectiveness of some of your interventions? And if so, how have you dealt with that? We, on, on almost all of our grants, we are looking at patient perceptions, okay, patient perceptions of their own well-being, patient perceptions of their health-related well-being. They benefit significantly from these. That's also information that we share with the insurance companies. But you know, even though I'm a, a physiologist and I like chemicals like high-density lipoprotein cholesterol, we're, we're actually very attentive to some of you know some of the behavioral aspects or behavioral benefits of physical activity they are part of almost all of our studies and in, and in fact the reason we did the aging study was that patients were reporting things in the first of the circuit studies that we hadn't anticipated okay and they were more behaviorally oriented and that's what caused us to add them in so we're also listening to our research subjects and what they're telling us so that we can adapt you know and, and anticipate new benefits I have a question from Denise here. Uh, my name is Denise from New Hampshire. I just wondered, is the home program that you were, have been speaking about, is that available online at your website? Uh, we have the article that we published it in with pictures that was published in Archives of PM&R. You can get that on the Miami Project website. And if not, just drop me a line, and we'll see that you have it. Great. Uh, we have a question in the front from Rocco.
Thank you, Dr. Nash, for, for this great talk and for your work in this area over the years. I would just like to get uh, your comment about aquatic therapy um, with regards to the cardiometabolic. Um, I find that the um, aquatic therapy is something that's the buoyancy helps my patients to be able to really get more movement and they really enjoy it, but I wonder how effective it is in, for this purpose. First, I love it. Okay. But I also live in South Florida where a lot of people have pools. And oftentimes, and my, again, my wife is in this scenario with patient care more than I am, okay, is that she is prescribing individual therapy in pools okay, for patients with lots of diagnosis, including neuromuscular-related disability. So that's the first thing. The second is uh, even some of the spas can be adapted with equipment. And you know, we have a patient who got one of the swimming tethers. Okay, he was tetraplegic, C5. He had, you know, he had a chair that would lower him into a small swimming pool he had behind his house. And he would put the tethers on and he would simply swim okay, while relatively stabilized and in a relatively small area. And he lost about 50 pounds doing that. Okay. And again, if, if you lose that much weight, lots of things are going to change for you. And a lot of things are going to get easier, and that's what he reports. Now, again, he, he, he joined that with a very carefully designed, prudent diet that was pretty close to Mediterranean okay, and has lost substantial amounts of weight. And he was really active before, but he, you know, he was constantly telling me he was tired okay, and was getting more difficult to do things like transfer and also to spend time with his family. So uh, I like it. It is buoyant. It, it makes activity easier for patients who have functional limitations of all sorts. And if you just want to use it for general exercise, it's, it's wonderful. We have time for one more question in the back here. Uh, my name is Rosa, and I would like to know what do you think about uh, raw food diet and food that is alive that's supposed to create uh, good blood and good cells? I, I didn't hear the kind of diet. The raw food diet and the diet and the food that is alive. Raw, raw food. Oh, raw food? Well, I like vegetables and, and fruits. Is, is that what we're talking about? Maybe, maybe I'm... Yes. I think the diet is all raw foods only. All raw foods. Nothing cooked above 40 degrees. Oh. Oh, dear. <laughs> I... I guess the first thing I say is I don't know enough about it, and I haven't read a lot about it or seen articles on it, certainly in, in spinal cord injury. Yeah, for, for diets, as, as long as they contain sufficient levels of, of, of the nutrients, and you know, we know roughly what you need in, in protein, fat, and carbohydrate, you know, if they satisfy those, I think that's good. And the, the largest question in diets is do we stay on them? Okay, compliance with diets that are further from mainstream food consumption, te people tend to be less compliant with them, and then they go back to old habits and tend to yo-yo. Okay, if you know eating healthy food is is good, you know, but again, you know, I, I need to know the nutrient composition of it before I could say one way or another. Thank okay, you, Doctor. And remember, all of you are going to lunch now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just thought I'd mention that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Dr. Nash is going to be available for um, some questions during lunch. Um, and all this talk about exercise has made me really hungry. So uh, there, there's box lunch out in the lobby. And I'd ask you to join me either in the lobby or the room next door. And I think we're going to try to come back within about 45 minutes to an hour. And we'll see you then. Thank you very much. Thanks.